and get us started. Sure. Okay. Go right ahead. All right. Well, to introduce myself, my name is Joanna Hahn. I'm the site manager here at the Levi and Catherine Coffin State Historic Site. I got to come along when the Interpretive Center opened, so I've been here since 2016. And so along with the uh, visits that people can enjoy um, year-round when we're uh, on those days that we're open during the week, we like to provide um, additional programming. And one of our goals, part of our mission here, is to be able to expand beyond just the history of the Underground Railroad. Some historians see it as sort of the first civil rights movement in the United States. Um, but civil rights continues to be a fight that we have here in the country. What does it mean for civil rights? And so uh, we hope to enhance and bring about further discussion around that. And so I am very excited to have Dr. Alec Lichtenstein from Indiana University in Bloomington. He's driven all this way, which I appreciate. Um, <laughs> and driving all the way back. No, um, but uh, he himself as a historian has been studying the history of civil rights in the United States and his latest project, which he's gonna talk about called Unmasked, uh, looks at how visual arts was used in the 1930s to speak out against lynchings. Um, and so just know that our topic is, is dealing with that subject matter. Do you know that we will be seeing images of lynchings in case you have um, perhaps get to a point where you need to step away for a few minutes. We completely understand. Yep. Please take your time. So I'll hand it over and uh, let him uh, okay. get a little further into the topic. Great. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to this a great spot, which I really am pleased uh, to, to visit for the first time. Uh, now, what I'm going to talk about today really is an exhibition that some colleagues of mine and I curated that currently is on at the Crispus Attucks Museum in Indianapolis uh, and also has been at the Civil Rights Heritage Center in South Bend and will be going to the Second Baptist Church in New Albany, Indiana. Uh, next month, and I'll conclude by pointing out why that's significant. Uh, it was really great to come into this building because it made me realize exactly what Joanna just alluded to, which is there is really a deep and rich connection between the 19th century civil rights struggle associated with abolition and the Underground Railroad and the 20th century civil rights struggles, among which was the struggle against lynching or uh, racist violence more generally. And there are plenty of connections to make, but the one that I wanna sort of point out now, because I just realized that when I walked into the building, I mean, from my line of sight now, I'm looking at that horrific image, which I think most people in the United States have seen at one time or another, which is an early, very early photograph from the 1860s of the formerly enslaved man with a scarred back, right? And this is one of the most reproduced images to illustrate the horrors of slavery. It's in textbooks, but of course, it initially circulated as a piece of abolitionist uh, propaganda, not in a bad way, to highlight uh, the horrors of slavery. And it's difficult to look at. Um, so too, what a lot of my talk is about today and really what the exhibit itself is about is uh, uh, how images of brutality, racial brutality, brutality meted out against black people by white people in the name of white supremacy, how those images have been used in order to combat racism. A difficult subject, uh, something that's hard to look at, but just as the abolitionists in the 19th century and people like Levi Coffin, who said, I hadn't realized this, but when I saw it on the wall upstairs, his entire reason for opposing slavery was having witnessed when he was a young boy uh, a beating that a slave uh, uh, had administered to, him, administered to him. So, so too, the 20th century campaign against lynching uh, argued that and felt that uh, the power of the image would hopefully sway at least some people's Minds. Now, what you're looking at here in the front slide, the first slide, is actually not <coughs> a lynching noose, okay? Not at all. That's a window cord uh, in a, uh, an apartment in Harlem, circa 1960. And it's a photograph taken by the great African-American photographer, Roy de Carava. And when I saw this photograph, I was really, really struck by it because, of course, it does look like a lynching noose, doesn't it? And it made me realize, and I, as I worked on this project with my co-curators, I began to look at a lot of art, particularly African-American art, with new eyes, and realized that lynching haunts 
the American imagination, but especially lynching haunts the African-American imagination in this country. And I realized as I started looking at more and more art that I would see these sort of things everywhere. And so that, which is in some ways is a very quotidian, banal photograph just outside Roy de Caravas' window in Harlem, and yet to me it's always been a haunted image. So as Joanna said, uh, I do want to warn you, there are some harsh images in this exhibit and therefore in my slideshow. Uh, I will say, however, that uh, we use only one photograph of a lynching in the entire exhibit. And I'll only expose you to one photograph of a lynching, although as you'll see, it's one that crops up over and over again. Nevertheless, the exhibit itself is based, as Joanna suggested, on the way that artworks were used, particularly in the 1930s, to try and advance the anti-lynching campaign, just the way that images like the one on the wall there were used in the 1840s and 1850s to try and sway people to the abolitionist cause. But when we curated this exhibit, we were very cognizant of this danger, right, of thinking about how do we display this material without it actually becoming a spectacle. How do we avoid making it so that the people in the exhibit are not like the people in this photograph that's behind there? Uh, I already heard someone allude to this, uh, perhaps unknowingly. That's Marion, Indiana in 1930, right? And that's the photograph that the exhibit itself investigates and interrogates, but in much of it, much of the exhibit, we use just the image uh, of the crowd and their faces which in many ways is the most shocking aspect mm -hmm. of the photograph, right? <clears throat> Finally, when we did do this exhibit, uh, it began at Indiana University in Bloomington. As I said, it's now in Indianapolis. It will then go to smaller venues, a bit like this, spaces like this around the state. Uh, but when we did it at IU back in March, uh, we organized it in a very specific way, which was that we only allowed students to go see it uh, in a guided tour. Right. So we had over the course of five weeks, uh, five interlocutors, tour guides like this gentleman you see on the left. Uh, that's uh, um, Reggie Jackson. Reggie actually uh, once worked at the America's Black Holocaust Museum in Milwaukee, which is the museum that was established by a man named James Cameron, who had survived the 1930 lynching of uh, in Marion, Indiana, and Reggie is sort of one of, of his uh, protégés, I would say. Okay, so now I have to say when we took it to Indianapolis to Crispus Attucks High School where there's a museum, the curator there was like, you don't need guided tours, I'm happy to have people come in. But when we did it at the university, we had these very, very dedicated tour guides, and that was a very effective way of, of bringing people in uh, to the exhibit. This man here, uh, Carlos Hill, is an expert, for instance, on the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. So he led tours of our exhibit. Finally, to give you a sense of the kind of material that we included in the exhibit itself, it was a mix of original artworks that I actually managed to acquire from the 1930s, mostly then reproductions of artworks, some ephemera, that is pamphlets and magazines, things like that, some video clips, which if we have time, I may play for you. Uh, some music, for example, Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit, which is a song written in the 1930s based on the Marion lynching photograph. And of course, text explaining what people uh, were looking at. <clears throat> now the exhibit had four, or has four elements to it, okay? As you'll see in a minute, we began by contrasting two very, very well-known art exhibits from 1935, both of which proclaimed that they were using art and artworks, not photographs, but art, to protest lynching with the very deliberate aim of securing an anti-lynching bill in the Congress, a federal anti-lynching bill. Because of course, uh, the, the local states, Mississippi or Marion, Indiana, Indiana for that matter, when there was a lynching, they would often not prosecute 
the lynchers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, it's not exactly a mystery or wasn't in 1930 who the people in the crowd were, right? But none of them were brought to justice. And so the NAACP, the National Association for the, the Advancement of Colored People and other activists uh, insisted that the only way to get justice for the victims of lynching was to have a federal civil rights law that people would be brought uh, charged by the federal U.S. district attorney and hauled into federal court because they wouldn't be and were not being uh, um, prosecuted in local and state courts. So we begin the exhibit with these two contrasting exhibits that I'll explain to you in a minute from 1935. Then we have some artwork that raises questions about artistic representation of lynching in general. Uh, then we ask viewers to think about how a photograph that was originally taken to glorify and celebrate a lynching, this photograph right here uh, in Marion, Indiana, was appropriated by anti-lynching activists as a form of protest. Now, that image of the uh, uh, former slave, of course, was no such thing. That was taken in a Union Army camp deliberately to illustrate here is what we are fighting against, right? But, and then finally, and perhaps most importantly, the exhibit looks very closely at local efforts around the state of Indiana to memorialize and commemorate the lives of the victims of lynching, to insist much the way this spot insists that this community was a, uh, a stop on the Underground Railroad, and we should remember that, uh, we also insist, and people around the state have been insisting, that certain communities, Marion among them, uh, were sites of lynching. And therefore, that's something that should be made visible on the landscape through memorial markers. So that's part of the exhibit, too. Oops. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So again, I think this is an image. Have any of you seen this image before? I'm curious. Some of you, yeah, you have, Joanna, right? So this is a very famous photograph taken, I don't know exactly when, but the mid-1930s during the height of the NAACP's anti-lynching campaign. And they very famously would hang out the, the, this is Fifth Avenue in New York City, which is where the NAACP headquarters was and may still be. And so they would very famously hang out this flag every time there was someone lynched. And that was, could be many, many days of the year, which was their point, okay? Uh, and so the exhibit begins by looking very closely at this particular art exhibition from 1935. This was the one that was put on by the NAACP, and it was called an Art Commentary on Lynching, all right? Uh, and this was in February 1935, and essentially Walter White, who is the president of the NAACP, let's see if I have the image somewhere, actually, see this image here? He had seen this image called This Is Her First Lynching, by the artist uh, uh, Reginald Marsh. It appeared in the New Yorker magazine in 1934. And Walter White said, that is a powerful image. I need to find images that will help galvanize the campaign against lynching and win, win people over so they'll write to their senators and congressmen and win this bill. And the way to do that, White said, was to shock them, to show them the horror and brutality of lynching itself. And that's what this exhibit, an art commentary on lynching, was about. Now, at the very same time, and really in response to the NAACP's exhibit, the left, that is the Communist Party, with the John Reed Club, as it was called, which was an organization of Communist Party artists. The Communist Party was very strong in the 1930s. It was the midst of the Depression. A lot of people joined the Communist Party at the time. Uh, they, too, said, we're also going to put on an exhibit. And we don't think the NAACP is radical enough. So we're going to put on an even more radical exhibit. And we're going to use this art to agitate the masses. All right? And the NAACP, they would say, was just a reformist organization. So we were very interested in these two different strategies that emerged at the height of the anti-lynching campaign. Now, they were both fighting for the same thing. That is an end to lynching. And yet they had a very, very different set of principles and ideas about how to do that. And people often ask us, what, what was their disagreement all about? And we tend to point them to this, the Scottsboro case. Have any of you heard of the Scottsboro case? No. Interesting. 
I mean, I could go on for hours about the Scottsboro case. The Scottsboro case uh, was going on throughout the 1930s. It began in 1931. In a nutshell, it was a case of nine young black men who had been uh, arrested while riding a train in northeastern Alabama, and uh, they were charged with raping two white women who had also been on the train, which they did not do. It's very clear that this was, and the community congratulated itself for not stringing them up for the nearest tree or railroad trestle, but instead bringing them to trial and sentencing them to death in a two-day trial with a 30-minute deliberation on the part of an all-white jury. And indeed, the reason today still that being tried by a jury of your peers must mean that the jury cannot be racially selected. That Supreme Court case dates back to the 1930s, as does the right to counsel, which these guys did not have, right, until this became a famous case with the great lawyer Samuel Leibowitz. Um, those two sort of principles of constitutional law were secured in response to the Scottsboro case in the 1930s. However, the NAACP pursued defense of the Scottsboro Boys through legalistic means, and the Communist Party said, no, 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 this must become a mass global campaign to save their lives. And so the two groups had been butting heads over who would represent the Scottsboro Boys, and so there was a lot of bad blood between them. And that's one of the reasons they had these rival exhibits. And uh, although we don't use this photograph, which is of the Scottsboro Boys, we do use this political cartoon in the exhibit, which suggests uh, in a scurrilous fashion, I think, that it says the Scottsboro legal lynching, the face of the NAACP with the arms of the bosses. So the Communist Party actually was accusing the NAACP of aiding the lynch mob. Mm -hmm. You can see why they didn't get along, okay? Um, and so the Communist Party put out a call for a united anti-lynch exhibition in contrast to the uh, NAACP exhibit as they saw it. And here's a quote from sort of their, uh, their own pamphlet. The NAACP exhibit couldn't have fighting pictures, but the pictures in the ACA gallery, that was the downtown gallery that, that hosted the Communist Party, they fight. They fight the Scottsboro frame up and the Klan and the chain gang. The real truth is that we can only stop lynching by struggle, mass organization of white and Negro workers, mass defense, mass pressure for a real fighting anti-lynching bill. So that's how they define themselves in contrast to the NAACP, right? And these two images, I think, are illustrative of the difference between the two exhibits. Both of these appear in our exhibit. One, the one I pointed to before, this is a very important image, right? It suggests, and this is, I can see why Walter White was drawn to it, that the spectacle of lynching was part of what I would call the pedagogy of white supremacy. That this was the way that young people would be inducted into supporting white supremacy by watching a lynching. Although, of course, it could cut the other way, right? Even with the Marion lynching, with that whole crowd of people sitting there almost celebrating, you can read accounts of it and there were a few people who vomited and left there clearly convinced that lynching was a horror and a blot on the nation. Although that was always a minority, just the way that Levi Coffin and other friends around him who, who would help the, the, what do you call them, freedom seekers, which is clearly a, a, an excellent term. Uh, uh, they were not the majority in Indiana or in the Northern states. They were a persecuted minority. And I think that's true of people who opposed lynching uh, as well in the 1930s. Uh, so contrast that, of course, to the Communist Party image, uh, which is all about black and white unite and fight, not even about lynching in that case, about a strike. All right, so the Communist Party was very eager to have a different uh, uh, message in their artworks. So the exhibit begins with some of the images from the NAACP exhibit. Now, here are some of them. Uh, this was the kind of image that the Communist Party hated right? That it was drawing on Christian and religious imagery, right? But this was a, a, a drawing that appeared in Langston Hughes's illustrated uh, play about the Scottsboro case. So the NAACP was well aware of that as well. Here are some more images from that exhibit. Uh, this artist is a very well-known artist. His name is John Stuart Curry. This one's called The Fugitive. 
This one's called Manhunt. So you get the idea of, of and this is by George Biddle. And that too is about the Scottsboro case. So despite what the party said, the NAACP was also well aware of the Scottsboro case as being an important uh, a form of what they called legal lynching. Okay, now we're getting to more difficult images. The one on your left, this one, is by Paul Cadmus, and very much, again, this was in the NAACP show, implicating the white viewer, right? Who has to either say, yes, I will join the lynch mob as I'm being invited to, or I will resist that siren call to white supremacy. And this one uh, has a whole story behind it, but this was one of Walter White's favorites, a uh, sculpture done by uh, uh, an amateur artist, and we found a photograph of Walter White, the head of the NAACP, 14 years later in 1949, with this still in his office. So this was very important to his sense of the struggle against racism and lynching. These two were from the NAACP exhibit. Walter White was quite explicit. I want people to come to this exhibit and I want them to be sick to their stomach. I want them to be unable to turn away and yet have to turn away because uh, they're intensely uncomfortable so that then they will leave and they will write to their congressman and their senator. And he invited not, you know, he invited the leading lights of New York's social and literary life. Um, well, the mayor, Fiorella LaGuardia, was there at the opening. The um, oh, a senator, Jacob Chavitz, was it Chavitz? Anyhow, a very well-known senator was there. Eleanor Roosevelt was a sponsor, okay? So Walter White was connected. Um, and these two, these two are by African-American artists. Uh, it's actually one of the ironies we discovered was that of the NAACP artworks, about 50, about 20% of them were by African-American artists. The rest were by whites. The Communist Party, which made a big deal of always being interracial, they didn't have a single African-American artist in their exhibit for whatever reason. Let's pause a minute. Okay, so... Uh, that is the exhibit that includes the work from an art commentary on lynching, the NAACP's effort to use art to prompt the anti-lynching bill. What you're looking at now is, uh, it's actually easier for me to come out here. This is what it looks like in what we call our pop-up version of the exhibit. Four panels, four feet across, that we just showed up in South Bend last week and that we're taking down to New Albany uh, at, in the first week in March and putting in a space, again, a space much like this. I had been hoping, Joanna, I can see there's no room, but it would have been very interesting <laughs> to do the, the pop-up display here. Okay, so then uh, we contrast that to the images from what the Communist Party called the struggle for Negro rights. One of the things the Communist Party did was they tried to broaden it well beyond lynching, right? They tried to address things, not just the Scottsboro case, but also uh, the problem of convict labor, of the chain gang, of sharecropping, of the Klan, although I will say NAACP did that. But the Communist Party claimed to have a much more systematic uh, um, analysis. Uh, the Communist Party also spent a lot of time, you can see here again, this is focusing on the Scottsboro uh, case. This is a Communist Party pamphlet. These two drawings appeared in the Communist uh, cultural magazine called New Masses. Uh, the point here being that they spent a lot of time implicating law enforcement. They regarded the trial of the Scottsboro Boys, or indeed the entire legal system that they said was shot through with racism, with some justice, and lynching as on a continuity, right? And they said that the NAACP was too invested in trying to use the legal system to protect black people when the legal system itself was hopelessly compromised. If you're familiar with debates today about police violence, there's a, a real parallel there between, you know, liberal groups who say, you know, we can reform the police, cameras, what have you, uh, uh, civilian review boards, and that will help uh, protect people of color from police violence. The left, the Black Lives Matter folks would say, no, no, the police are hopelessly embedded as part of the system of racism what and they have the to swastika? go. Well, what do you think? What about the swastika? What's that doing there? It's a very, very good question. Why is the swastika in there? Because the 30s, right? Yeah. 
So what, obviously that's not a pro-Nazi uh, 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 symbol, right? So a lot of the artists, go ahead, Aaron. Were you, were you gonna say something or? No. Oh, okay. I think it's the U.S. courts. Right, here, right. right. So the, the, that's suggesting that essentially the U.S. court system is, uh, has been taken over by fascism mm -hmm. as far as black people are concerned. And a lot of the artists, particularly the Communist Party artists, were Jewish. Right? So they were well aware of what was going on in Nazi Germany in 1935, and they were trying to draw that parallel. Exactly right. Um, these two also from the Communist Party art show. A uh, couple things going on here. This one, of course, suggesting the entire panoply of Southern, they would attribute it to the South primarily, of Southern uh, racist repression, the Klan, the lynching, and the chain gang, all part of the same system. Uh, as well as, I think there was an image of, and, and cotton being at the base of it. And this image, of course, and this one could have been in the NAACP, not only suggesting, though, the collusion of law enforcement, but also pointing quite uh, directly to one of the great uh, uh, false charges and justifications, in quotes, of lynching, which was it was the only way that white women could be protected mm -hmm. from black men. Right, that was the excuse wheeled out over and over again. Indeed, this painting drawing by uh, uh, Philip Evergood, I believe, is called There's the Man, right? So suggesting that, and again, the Scottsboro case was a classic example of this when the two young white women who were also hoboing on the train got off the train, they were worried they'd be arrested for vagrancy and or prostitution. And so they said, oh, those, those black guys attacked us, okay? Here too, then, is what it looks like uh, in its pop-up version when we travel with it. So three panels of that show. Now, <clears throat> although we began with this idea of these two dueling exhibits from 1935 to illustrate kind of different approaches to the question of how to agitate against lynching, as we looked at more and more artworks, we came to realize that, you know, we didn't want just to think about and focus on the moment of lynching and the horrors of that, as significant as that was. But as I suggested in that opening slide, we realized how much lynching haunted the black artistic imagination and black cultural imagination in this country. So we built a section that we called Those Left Behind, okay? And we actually realized we wanted to begin in this case with photography. On the left, well, anyone know who that is? Maybe you do. One of the great anti-lynching crusaders, really the person who invented the American anti-lynching crusade, someone who was in many ways the link between emancipation and the civil rights movement of the 20th century. Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Uh, uh, Ida B. Wells. All right. And Ida B. Wells was really the first person in the 1890s to say the way to combat lynching is to show the horrible truth of it in text and in photographs. We found this photograph, this is from 1894 as it says, these, the three other people in the photograph are the family left behind by Thomas Moss, who was lynched in Memphis in 1892, which is what started Ida B. Wells' anti-lynching crusade. And interestingly enough, we discovered this photograph of the Moss family, the family that Tommy Moss left behind when he was lynched, uh, was taken in Indianapolis mm -hmm. because that's where Elizabeth Moss and her two children moved mm -hmm. when they had to flee Memphis in 1892. And Ida B. Wells left and went to Chicago, but went and visited the Moss family in 1894. I cannot find the photo studio where it was, but interestingly enough, I just, how, how many of you have been to Indianapolis or spent time in Indianapolis? Raise your hand. Some of you have. Okay, right? So I was able to find Elizabeth Moss in the census. The street that she lived on no longer exists. Why? Because it's underneath I-65, <laughs> right? But it's about a half mile from the Crispus Attucks School and Museum. So that was very powerful. The one on the, on the right, your right, is a woman named Annie Mae uh, Merriweather, and this is a photograph that was taken in 1935, so that same year as the anti-lynching exhibits, and published in the New Masses, again, which was the left-wing uh, magazine. That's another photograph of her, and published next to her telling her story of how her husband, who was an organizer of a sharecropper's union in, um, 
in Alabama, yes, in Alabama, uh, telling her story of, of how they were attacked and her husband was lynched. So again, uh, I saw this, and I think that's right, very much in the sort of tradition of using images and texts the way Ida B. Wells had in the 1890s to continue the anti-lynching campaign. But we also found this repeatedly, repeatedly in artworks. The one in the center actually became very much kind of a signature image. Now again, these were not in the 1935 exhibits. These were painted or, or uh, drawn uh, a few years later, but the one in the center is by one of the greatest African-American artists of the 20th century, Jacob Lawrence who did a really amazing series of 60 panels called The Great Migration, where he told the story of African-Americans leaving the South around World War I and migrating to places like Chicago, Indianapolis, Cleveland, uh, and, and other northern industrial cities, uh, um, fleeing, amongst other things, the terror of lynching. Right? So this is Lawrence's, I think it's panel number 15, and it says, and there were lynchings. And he makes that a poignant part of why black people were fleeing the South en masse, only it turns out to discover that they couldn't entirely escape racist violence in places like Marion. Just as when blacks left the South and came to Indiana, they discovered they lived in a state that had a constitution that actually discriminated against them, right? So very, very similar. Uh, the one, this image is by the great artist uh, and printmaker Elizabeth Catlett, and it's called, um, oh, why can't I remember what it's called? Um, uh, anyhow, it's about the anxiety that black women constantly live with, that their loved ones, their husbands, their fathers, their sons, what? And a special fear for my loved ones. Thank you. Your eyes are better than mine. So I'm trying to read it on the screen. So, and again, this is part of a series that Catlett did of 15 prints about black womanhood. But this, again, the sense that the threat of lynching and the aftermath of lynching is uh, a constant presence haunting the black imagination. And this is a painting done by a Jewish artist named Joseph Hirsch in 1946, which actually appeared as a drawing in the New Masses first. And this hangs in uh, uh, the Atkins Museum in Kansas City. And although I don't know if I'm gonna have time to play it for you, we found a black poet in Kansas City who wrote and reads a poem about, in the voice of the lynching victim. But here again, we have this imagery which suggests you know, that the aftermath of lynching, its impact on families, on communities, uh, on children, on memories uh, is long lasting and goes well beyond the immediate moment. <clears throat> and so too, this image we felt by, this one was in the 1935 exhibit, the NAACP exhibit, by uh, the great uh, artist uh, uh, Hale Woodruff. Um, and there too, this sense that, you know, lynching wasn't just about punishing an individual, right? Lynching was about terrorizing a community. So laying the body on the steps of a black church was clearly <laughs> A strong way of doing that. On the right, and I'm going to return to this later, is a reprint of this done by a contemporary artist who reprinted many of these works but removed the physical body. Right? So he took Woodruff's print and he removed the image of the lynching, uh, the lynched victim itself or himself. Again, gesturing back to that, we can understand the horror of lynching without necessarily participating in it by looking at the violence. I'm not sure if I agree with that, but this was an effort to, to do a creative way of thinking about that. And again, here's what all of the images of those left behind look like in a complete panel that has been um, uh, mounted. Now, this seems a little superfluous, doesn't it? Because you've already seen several graphic images. However, we do believe, and I do believe, that there is a distinction and a difference between representative artworks, which are hard enough to look at, and a physical photograph, which is actually, you know, just like that man there is an individual whose back was scarred through a whipping, and there's a photograph of that. So too, when you look at a lynching photograph, it is a human being who was murdered, and you're looking at that murdered body in its aftermath, and it's difficult, okay? So, uh, many of you probably have seen this photograph, all right? This is the infamous photograph and the infamous lynching 
Marion, Indiana, August 7th, 1930. Now, why is this photograph so infamous? Well, one of the things we argue in the exhibit and talk about is the way that it circulated, okay? In its first instance, like immediately, the day after, two days after the lynching, the photographer, a man named Lawrence Beitler, who had a studio right on the town square where the lynching occurred in Marion. Have any of you been to Marion and to the Grant, Grant County Courthouse? So you know, okay, there's the quite lovely town square. A lot of it's deserted now. Beitler's studio is one of those buildings. Obviously, he heard the commotion outside. He ran down there with his camera. He took the picture, and you know, then he thought, well, I'll circulate this as a postcard. Sell it for 50 cents or whatever he sold it for. Um, we got this one from the Beinecke Library at Yale University. It does not have any writing on the back, so obviously it's one that was never used. Uh, I haven't seen others, but I'm sure they're lying in people's basements, all right? And safe deposit boxes and whatever, okay? With stamps and with writing. This was a way of boasting, of celebrating this particularly heinous act of August 7th, 1930. There's no shame, as you can see in the crowd, all right? However, one of the things we explore in the exhibit is that that was not the end of the photograph. In fact, it was the only the beginning of the photograph. Very quickly, this was picked up by the very forces that by 1935 were protesting against lynching. That photograph appeared in the Daily Worker almost just only a week afterwards, uh, and almost immediately in the Chicago Defender, the country's largest and most significant African-American newspaper, which had been established in the Great Migration, actually, by someone who had migrated to Chicago from the South. Uh, so again, this was something of a, uh, a, well, the Communist Party had one interpretation of it, right? Uh, and the uh, Chicago Defender had another, and the NAACP, yet another, uh, pointing to the irony of civilization in the United States. So that's in The Crisis, which was the NAACP's uh, nationally circulated magazine. And then we discovered that the Soviet Union, probably the Communist Party, passed this over to Russia. And actually, I don't have it here, but I even found a newspaper from 1930, a Soviet newspaper, that used this image like just three weeks later. So this was an image that circulated internationally. And now we've also found it in, uh, interestingly enough, Nazi propaganda, anti-US Nazi propaganda. And we hope to take the exhibit to Berlin where we'll do a panel on that. Um, it also circulated in a different way through sound, right? So as I alluded to before, the famous jazz singer Billie Holiday in 1937 or 38, I can't quite remember, uh, uh, took this song, Strange Fruit, that was actually originally published as a poem in the New Masses and was a response to the Marian lynching. Uh, again, interestingly enough, of course, Strange Fruit alludes entirely to the South. It's all about the South. But the image that prompted it was in Marion, Indiana. And you frequently might see this lynching image, this photograph of Marion, mislabeled as being the American South, right? strangely enough or interestingly enough. Um, and so, uh, so we use the music as well. And uh, Strange Fruit was then recorded again in 1946 by the folk singer Josh White, and then again in 1970 by uh, Nina Simone, who was part of the civil rights movement. So we see that the, the image and the sound kind of migrated over time. We found a pamphlet from the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Southern Nonviolent Coordinating Committee from 1964 published this pamphlet. And there it is again, right? Right there. That is the image, right? Sliced up. Where they got it, I, that I can't trace. We found contemporary artworks. This one is by the artist Betty Saar. And actually, although I've not seen it in person, I've been told you guys might go check this out, that this artwork is over in Wilberforce. So that's what, an hour from here? Less 40 minutes from here, probably? Just drive over to Ohio. There's an African-American museum in Wilberforce. I've been told this is where this work is, right? So uh, very interesting use uh, of the photograph. 
And then we also discovered that the great uh, artist for the Black Panther Party, Emory Douglas, incorporated it at least twice into his photo collage, all right? But often suggesting, particularly in this one, that it was something that had occurred in the South. And for those of you looking at the crowd, I doubt there are too many of you, but those of you who are big uh, fans of hip hop music, um, we discovered that Public Enemy used this in their Hazy Shade of Criminal art, uh, um, album back in the 1990s. This is really in many ways, and again, if, if there's time later on, I, I can show you a film clip uh, of the artist discussing what he did in this particular artwork. The artist is named Kerry James Marshall, but this is really quite extraordinary. So this is a giant artwork. It would, if you saw the actual artwork, it would take up this entire wall, okay? And I don't know if you can quite make it out, but in a very, very faint way, Behind the lockets is actually a reproduction of the Marion photograph, right? But he's pulled out the faces of the three women in the crowd. And what he argues is that these are three, he points, he says there are three generations of women. So that this act, so he says something like, uh, you know, you look at the faces of the crowd and he says, you know, I wasn't struck by the brutality of the hanging bodies. I was struck by the crowd, right? And he says, you know, and then I thought about these three women and I thought about heirlooms, and that's why he creates the lockets, and accessories. So he says, everyone in the crowd that night was an accessory to a double murder. And then he said, but of course, the, the heirloom of this was the passing down of that sort of learning how to be inured to racial brutality, learning the codes of white supremacy, much the way that the Reginald Marsh drawing this is her first lynching, also suggested. I have no evidence that Marsh had seen the Marion photograph when he drew that drawing four years later, but I often wonder. But Carrie James Marshall did this artwork, you know, in 2005 or something like that. And it's really, really amazing. And so he's really playing with this notion of the heritage of white supremacy being embedded in the crowd there. And here again is Ken Gonzalez Day, who has removed the bodies and retain the photograph so you really realize that what this photograph is really about inadvertently are the accessories, are the people in that crowd that night. Finally, so we had the, the 1935 exhibits. We had a section or we have a section on those left behind. We have the section on, uh, uh, on the Marion photograph and its circulation and recirculation and reuse in many different contexts. And finally, what we put at the end of the exhibit was a meditation about memory and place. Have any of you been to Montgomery, Alabama? Okay, so you've seen this, right? And this is really, as, as uh, uh, Daryl Heller, who runs the Civil Rights Heritage Center in South Bend said to me last week, he said, this is by far the most important monument in the United States, period, right? Uh, it is really, really powerful. It's unforgettable, actually. And those of you who've been there, those of you who haven't, you must go. Uh, it's actually based on partially on the uh, Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe in the center of Berlin, which has the same sort of large blocks to represent murdered people. But it's also connected to the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg, South Africa, which has hanging nooses for each person who had been executed by the Apartheid government under white supremacy there. The designers and Brian Stevenson came up with this giant memorial. Each of these giant plinths has you know, the names of all the people who were lynched in a particular county. And there is one for Grant County, Indiana, uh, uh, with the names of Thomas Shipp and uh, Edmund Smith on it. Okay, now in theory, the idea is that communities where these lynchings happen will reclaim these giant plinths and will then display them at the site of the lynching, which more often than not was not out in the backwoods, but which was in the center of town at the county courthouse, precisely because this was designed to be uh, a spectacle and to demonstrate uh, to black citizens that they better live in fear and to white citizens that they could behave this way with impunity. That was the entire point of lynching. So we visited, we meaning myself and my co-curators, Phoebe Wolfskill and Rasul Moat, uh, visited this site, were quite struck by it, 
and then learned that there are a lot of efforts like this going on right here in Indiana on a regular basis. And so we thought we wanted to display four, and actually now five, but in the original exhibit, four examples of this, all right? This one actually really important. This is down in Southwest Indiana, uh, where a young woman named Sophie Kloppenberg, who was in high school at the time, uh, did a school project and said, wow, I didn't realize that these, I think it's eight men were lynched in this town in 1878, and there's no marker. There's no memory of it. It's been erased as part of the town's history. And so she insisted, went to the county commission, went to the city leaders in Mount Vernon, Posey County, and said, we have to mark this. And she managed to get them to put up a marker. Very impressive. And we had her come speak at one of our events, and she's going to come speak in New Albany as well. So this was really a struggle for memory, right? Uh, ditto in uh, Terre Haute, where there was a lynching in 1901, the lynching of George Ward. Uh, and so in the past few years, let's see, when was it? Yeah, in, uh, the lynching itself was in 1901, and the memorial event was in 2021. Uh, and they erected a marker. And in fact, Terry Ward, this man here, uh, is uh, a descendant of the man who was lynched in 1901. And Terry was very much the moving force behind this. And what he's doing there is he's filling up a glass jar with dirt from the lynching site. And those glass jars then get sent to Montgomery. For those of you who've been to Montgomery, they display from every county that has collected dirt from a lynching site, they display the jar. It's again, very powerful. Uh, in Indianapolis, there was uh, a discovery of a, of a lynching from 1922. The death certificate said, said that it was suicide, and a local coalition, the Indiana Remembrance Coalition, persuaded the uh, city coroner in Marion County uh, in Indianapolis to change the death certificate to murder, because this clearly was a lynching, and there was a ceremony uh, to that in 2022. Two, I believe. And then finally, in Marion itself, there is a community remembrance project here again, soil collection for the dirt jars. Uh, and this is sort of the, the conclusion to our exhibit designed to prompt people to think about what could be commemorated in their communities. It wouldn't necessarily have to be racist violence, although those things need to be commemorated, but this community by commemorating the coffins would be a nice example of something that, that's, uh, that's going on. And that's what it looks like now in our temporary pop-up exhibit. Here now we added one because there recently was a, uh, a marker placed in downtown Indianapolis where there was a lynching in 1845, right? So again, uh, the exhibit attempts to take people through from those anti-lynching campaigns of the 1930s through the kind of haunted imagination of lynching through the photograph and then finally to remind people that the way to combat forgetting is to insist on remembering, right? And that's really what the exhibit is about as we take it around. Here we have it uh, in South Bend at the Civil Rights Heritage Center. We, on, uh, so there were about 50 people there at the opening, really, really amazing. As I said, we're gonna take it down to, uh, um, to the Second Baptist Church. It was striking to me to come in here and realize looking at the map that that was the first stop on the Underground Railroad when escaped slaves uh, uh, crossed from Kentucky into Indiana. They went to the Second Baptist Church in New Albany and then made their way north to here, for instance, or there, I guess the Coffin House, right? So that, uh, and so I'm very pleased that we're having the exhibit down at that site in uh, New Albany. The one thing I wish we were doing that so far we're not doing is taking it to Grant County and to Marion, right? That's, a, that's really what I wanna do. There are empty storefronts all around the square. For those of you who've been there, uh, I keep thinking, we just need to rent one of those storefronts for a month and put this exhibit up in there uh, in sight of the courthouse, where there are plenty of memorials and markers, just not to this event. Everyone in town who lives in town, who's lived in town for years and years and years, is well aware of this event, but no one is willing to mark it. And as I said in other lectures to people not from Indiana, like if you moved to Marion, Indiana from wherever, you would never know that this was not only part of the town's history, but maybe one of the most important parts 
of the town's history. Again, looking at one of the maps upstairs, I think on the top floor, Joanna, I was struck by also, there's some wonderful lights where you can press and you can see where 19th century African-American communities were and where Quaker friends communities were. And there's a cluster right there in Grant County because there was, uh, right, right outside Marion, there's a town called Weaver in which, uh, well, you may know the history better than I do, Joanna, but which to this day is an African-American community. It was a community that was terrorized in 1930. They were afraid with good reason that the lynching on the town square would be followed by a pogrom where they'd be attacked in Weaver. They armed themselves. They were not attacked that night. They were very fortunate. And, uh, and uh, uh, Thomas Shipp and a Abraham Smith are buried out there, uh, five miles outside of Marion in near this community called Weaver, which, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Joanna, but which was partially founded because Quakers donated land to their black yeah. neighbors, right? Okay, so I have that right. So, so there's a very interesting and important history here, uh, one of struggle as well as, as horror, and that's a story that we try to tell in the exhibit as well. So I've talked long enough, um, and I hope you have questions, comments. I'll just leave that particular image up because I think it's a, it's a good one. So really the goal here for me has always been to uh, prompt people in Marion to come up with some kind of marker or memorial that gets erected on the town square. I don't know if that's gonna happen or not. Yes. The book um, Cynthia Carr wrote. Mm, our, our town. town. I heard yeah. that book so many times. Yeah. So, we yeah. so you know the story very well, well then. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. all that time, there were groups that tried, and this was the late 90s. Yep. I think the yep. book was written in 2005. That's right. Um, and, you know, they wanted to put something out in the courthouse, and some said, well, we could put something inside the courthouse. Right. But right. it was interesting that it seemed like a lot of the black community did not want That's to still the it. case. That's still the case. I mean, it's divided, right? right? So, I was just saying to my husband yeah. and I, we know our daughter's friend lives in Marion, and is mm -hmm. married to a black mm -hmm. man. And I'm like, okay, you know, this is almost 20 years since... Put me in touch with, put me in touch with them. Maybe... Maybe they're at that. We tried. So uh, it's an interesting. So we, the, the, that's, when we started this process, that's the first place we went. And we sat down with some of the people in the community. And interestingly enough, we met with uh, um, some of the NAACP chapter there. It's a woman named Jocelyn Whitaker, really fantastic woman who's from Arkansas originally, like so many people, uh, from Phillips County, Arkansas, which is the site, by the way, of a huge racial massacre in 1919 that was investigated by Ida B. Wells. So, that, right? so but Jocelyn, you know, that's way back. But So Jocelyn was all for this. But then there's another group, some of them descendants and some of them speaking in the name of the descendants of the victims who are much less sure that they want to have it. All right. And so in the end, they did the soil collection, which I think was great. Uh, and they had a, a march. Let's see if we have that image. Uh, yeah, you can see there they had a march, they had a soil collection. But when we went, they said, well, we don't want that exhibit here. You guys are going to tell us what to do. We said, no, no, no. We just want to stimulate discussion. So I still have some hopes that something could come of it. There's a very... Uh, well, a couple things. There's a very well-known contemporary artist named Samuel Levy Jones. Uh, and Sam, you know, is doing some artworks. They're abstract artworks, but they play with this. And, I don't, and I've heard that there is an effort to put a memorial up there, although I haven't seen the design for it yet. And when we opened at the Christmas Attics Museum back in August, uh, there were two people in the audience from Marion, one of whom was a descendant of the victims who asked to speak, and I let her speak, of course. So, uh, so yes, I, th I think there's, but, but you're absolutely right. What happens is there, every 20 years or so, there's kind of a movement to try and commemorate it, either stimulated by a book like Cynthia Carr's book, or that night, James Cameron famously escaped from the lynching, uh, went on to found this museum in Milwaukee where we're gonna take the exhibit. And so in the 80s, there are pictures of him. He came back to Marion. He sat in the old jail cell where he had been held and they pulled him out in 1930. She said also in the book, a lot of people, some of the black people still didn't believe he was really involved. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So, so there's a picture of him in his old jail cell that was published in Ebony magazine in like 1985 or 86. So suddenly the memory was unearthed again and then let to sink down again, which I always say is exactly why you need a physical marker, because otherwise every generation has to learn it all over again. And when there's a physical marker, 
something permanent, some, you know, it's true, I agree, people walk past these things and pay no mind to them, but sometimes they say, what's that, daddy? You know, and then uh, you have a physical marker which says this happened here. And I think it's really important. And there are lots and lots of communities now which are finally doing that, not just in Indiana, in Waco, Texas is a very famous place where there was an infamous lynching. Actually, let's see if we have um, the image from that. Uh, yeah, that's Waco, Texas in 2016, the 100th anniversary of a famous lynching or infamous lynching in Waco, Texas, attended by thousands and thousands of people. Uh, that's the descendants of the man who was lynched, Jesse Washington, uh, looking up at the balcony where a famous photograph was taken from the city hall of this lynching. And the mayor apologized on this day on behalf of the town. And then the, the NAACP erected a marker. So Actually, uh, my brother took that photograph. So my brother and I have collaborated on sort of memory projects where he takes photographs of sites that are forgotten or sometimes remembered, and then I write text to them. And actually, this other one is his photograph as well. That is an impromptu memorial thrown up in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, commemorate the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson. And that too was sort of part of our thinking. How, how, how do memories around these events get either buried or brought to life? I think that's really what the exhibit's all about. So. How many documented lynchings were in Indiana? 18. Right. Which sounds like that's 18 too many, but there's some counties in South Carolina that had 18, yes. I did try to Google that and got nothing. And really? you know, Google what? Okay. How many lynchings oh, yeah. were in Indiana? Yeah. And I was surprised because you know I can find all kinds of things. <laughs> Not how many lynchings. Well, you should Google again, though. I mean, I don't think it's a deep secret. I mean, for for starters, the Equal Justice Initiative in in Alabama has counted these and they have them marked on the the stones. But that's interesting. Sometimes Google doesn't like you to use the word lynching. You might have protections on your, because as you were saying, Joanna, you couldn't post on we were Facebook. We going to do a Facebook right. ad to promote right. our event tonight, and Facebook was denying us, and we we're thinking it's because. And see, know. it's interesting, because of course, the reason for that is, is, is good in a way, because it's, these are, this isn't something you want to popularize, but at the same time, it means it gets forgotten. This is exactly the tension about uh, remembering or forgetting uh, that, that we're trying to to sort of negotiate. I mean, this, you know, this was a challenge. When we first opened it at IU, there was one woman who ran out sobbing the first opening night. Uh, and we ran after her and sort of talked to her. But, um, but for the most part, people have responded positively. I mean, no one has said, you really shouldn't be showing this or you shouldn't have this stuff on the wall. So we kind of did anticipate we'd get some of that. But so far, and I've had more than a few people, black people say to me, you know, I really appreciate the way you did this. We, we think it's done with proper sensitivity. So I'm, I'm sure there are people who are offended by it, but you know, you can't please everyone. Do you have uh, any relationship with public schools at all, you know, K-12? Uh, well, I mean, Crispus Attucks Museum is attached to Crispus Attucks High School. Mm -hmm. So there's a very, very direct relationship there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, you know, again, the site is really important. That is a crucial memory site for the African-American community in Indianapolis. It was the segregated black high school for 40 years in Indianapolis. It's where, you know, trained a whole generation of, of black success drivers, black middle class. It was the escalator to the black middle class in the 40s and the 50s uh, in, in Indianapolis. They're very proud of it. So the museum there talks about the school's legacy and our exhibit is in there and the curator. Yeah. So he brings school kids through there all the time. Now, you know, you don't want to let have little kids. Actually, Robert Chester, the curator there is like, I don't care how little they are. They have to come see this. But I'm like, no, no, no. High school, maybe younger than high school. These images, I think, are tough. Uh, but yeah, so so there we have a close relationship. Now, uh, when we started the project, you know, I've been talking to some people at IU uh, PUI about, well, let's try and build it into a curriculum. I never got that off the ground. I just, you know, then we could still do that. But yeah, but again, you, you know, it's not necessarily something that kids want or should see. Do you yes, see right. possibly an online presence? It's a great question. We always get asked that, and I usually say no, 
partly because I don't really want these, you know, my sense is, you know, when we do it as an exhibit, it's true it limits who can see it, but we have a certain amount of control over it, either control over who actually comes and sees it or how they encounter it, but at least control over the narrative so that every image is presented with clear text. There's one bit of online uh, uh, that we have, which is that I taught a class uh, at IU connected to this, and I had the students write up some extra curatorial material, and in the exhibit itself, we have QR codes, which uh, people can click on and then get the image with a sort of an enhanced narrative explaining who the artist was and what they were doing, but that's the only exception. But so far, I've kind of, now if you Google some of these paintings or images, it, it does exist online in other places. The, um, uh, what's it called in Baltimore, the, the um, Maryland Institute of Art or something like that has a tiny online exhibit based on this. But I've always felt that I'd, I'd rather not do that. Maybe I'll change my mind, but. Is there any place you'd be turned down? Well, Marion, for starters, uh, but uh, well, not not explicitly turned down. This well, Mar well, I would say Marion and the IU Museum. We did show it at IU, but the IU Art Museum didn't want to do it, much to my irritation. But in the end, uh, you know, it's turned out to be a great thing to put in these sort of community-based spaces, like Christmas Attics, Civil Rights Heritage Center in uh, South Bend is in an old. Uh, swimming pool building that was a segregated swimming pool and that was a sort of flashpoint for desegregation in that community. It's a really good space. And as I said, New Albany, it'll be in this space, which is already uh, a commemorative space for the history of the Underground Railroad. And I realized, Joanna, as we were talking, although, I mean, they didn't explicitly turn me down, but I have sent emails to Cincinnati and I think that would be yeah. to the Freedom Center, which would be a really, really good place. But, but I will say our funding comes from um, Eli Lilly and company. And so it explicitly, they will pay for us to show it around Indiana, but it might, well, they might if we have money left over, but I'd have to make an argument to say, well, you know, can we take it to Cincinnati? I, I, right now I'm trying to convince them to let us take it to Milwaukee to the America's Black Holocaust Museum. That at least is a strong Indiana connection, right? Because it's directly an outgrowth of the history of Marion and the Marion lynching, but yeah. It was James Cameron wanted that museum in Marion. Yeah, yeah, but you know, no, that wasn't going to happen. But uh, but but again, I mean, I'm hopeful there is this. I mean, all of all five of those memorial events have happened in the past four years. I mean, and a lot of this is stimulated and encouraged by uh, by Montgomery by this National Memorial for Peace and Justice that was set up in in Montgomery, which really is an amazing, amazing. Site. And also one of the things we did was we had a workshop in Indianapolis where we invited people doing this kind of work from all around the South. So from Elaine, Arkansas, from Union County, South Carolina, from Texas, where there's a really interesting memorial project around a convict labor camp outside of Houston. And so we had these people come and just talk to one another. In Memphis, there's a whole project around Ida B. Wells and, and uh, lynching sites in Memphis. So there really is a... a, a a huge number of local communities doing this kind of work. And I think it's really, really exciting. It's changed me as a historian. I used to just, you know, write history books and articles that no one never reads, which is how you get ahead in academia. <laughs> it's how you get ahead in that. You got that? Okay. It's how you get ahead in academia. But I sort of said, well, no, I actually want to do things that ordinary people might connect with in, in their communities. And so for me, that's been fantastic. And so having all those people come talk to, to us, really, uh, rather than us talking to them, uh, was really one of the best things I've done. So, but you know, that's what tenure and academic freedom are for. You can write your legislators right now and tell them that SB 202 is not gonna help with that sort of, right? Do I offer, did it, well, here's a good, did I offer intellectual balance and diversity? Did I give you the pro-lynching view? That's probably what I'd be required to do under this new bill, which is about to pass, SB 202. So if you feel like it, you can write to your local rep, who I would imagine is probably in the GOP, uh, and say, please oppose SB 202. It's bad for IU higher education. It's bad for the university.
it is just for the university level? Yeah. It's all about saying, well, you should go look it up. <laughs> but essentially, it's all about saying that uh, the, the legislature should have the power to sort of reach down into the classroom and investigate whether we're offering diverse, both sides, right? So they would never say that that means, I mean, they, they don't really mean, I don't think that that means I'm supposed to give you the pro-lynching side, or if you're teaching the history of Nazism, you're supposed to offer Holocaust denial. They would not say that. But, but it is a direct effort to interfere with what we teach, which is unfortunate, I think. So, um, but I've used my, you know, tenure and academic freedom to say, I don't feel like writing academic books anymore. I feel like doing things like this exhibit. It's been exhilarating for me and, and really important work. And I, and I appreciate that, you know, people like you are willing to come out uh, on a Thursday night and, and uh, hear me talk about it. So. I'm happy to stick around if you have other questions, comments. I was a history major in college, but right. I do not remember hearing about the Tulsa. Yeah. <laughs> well, everyone says that, right? Where, where were you a history major? Paul State. Yeah, yeah probably, yes. Um, USF, Florida, mm -hmm. and I did history, and you, nothing. Yeah. You never took a course with Gary Morino? I took black history class. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I taught at Florida International for 20 years so in, in Miami. So yeah, I know a lot of people at USF. Um, they teach that stuff now. Actually, the, the, the greatest historian of the Freedom Riders movement, so that part of the Civil Rights Movement, is a guy named Ray Arsenault, and he teaches at USF. He's the leading expert in the country, I would say, on the Freedom Rides. So he interviewed every single Freedom Rider who was still alive when he wrote the book. So. But yeah, but it, but uh, a lot of this history gets passed over, right? But now the Tulsa massacre is something that a lot of people know about, right? Times have changed. I mean, largely because people in that community, like the guy we had, uh, Carlos Hill, have done that work, have insisted that this history be told, have tried to dug up, dig up the mass graves, uh, have a museum that talks about what the community looked like before it was destroyed. I haven't been out there yet, but I've been meaning to make a trip. So, so that's what gives me hope. Is there actually, you know, the, the, the memorial landscape is really changing in this country. And that's good. That's good. So, and places like this are a nice example. James Cameron's museum, in the book, it's in yeah. Carr's book, and he's struggling to keep it open, and it's just him. How... So it, it, it sort of closed for a while, but now it's been reborn. It had a new infusion of money. I've, I've been up there, you know, I was up there a year or two ago, and it's going very well. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, you know, uh, it's alive and well. They have a new building. It looks really great. It's on the north side of Milwaukee and um, worth a visit if you're up that way, for sure. Um, and the people who run it are really good. Yeah. But if you, so who has not been to Montgomery? Or have all of you been to Montgomery? Or just, are you the only two who've been? Yeah. I mean, and, and often, you know, did you go on your own or did you, did you go with a group? Okay. Right. Well, that's a good reason to go. I mean, and, uh, but, but from, yeah, the museum's amazing. Oh, I've been there three times. Yeah. But so in Indianapolis, for instance, usually there, there are, are organized church groups that go down there for a couple of days. I mean, uh, so there probably are groups around here that might be willing to do that too. So, all right. Well, thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, great. Thanks. My pleasure. <laughs>